My name is Peter Allen. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, a project is titled Understanding Physiological Responses of Kohinoba to Environmental Hypoxia Guiding Sustainable Chilean Aquaculture. I'm from Mississippi State University. And I have a couple colleagues I'm working with here, Dr. Claudia Alvarez and Dr. Katarina Brocourt. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about them and the opportunities here in a minute. So, next slide, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, who am I? Where did I come from? Out of curiosity, anybody in this room been to Mississippi before? Okay, I have. Uh, <laughs> okay. Good. Good. So, this is Mississippi. Uh, this is our, our camp, is sort of the heart of it, a picture right there that I grabbed off the web. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm an associate professor in the College of Forest Resources, which is one of eight colleges within Mississippi State University. So we've got vet school, uh, law school, business school, et cetera, et cetera. No problem. Uh, and so my interests are, I'm in the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, Aquaculture. Uh, I've been there about 10 years. And so this was an amazing time of opportunity for me because I have tenure and I had just sort of this window between lots of grad students and not as many and you know uh, the stars lined up I guess they literally did because we, we moved here right in the middle of the eclipse and uh -huh. uh, so that was a really neat opportunity in La Serena. My interests are in physiological ecology which is basically using physiology to understand the ecological niche of an organism, how it functions and I study fish and apply it to aquaculture. Uh, Fulbright is an, a wonderful opportunity, and uh, you know, if I don't say it enough, thank you, thank you, Mason, thank you, everybody here for this opportunity. It's really amazing, uh, and I'm working with great people here. So I'm in Coquimbo slash La Serena, literally. I can walk between the two. There's like a, a, a dividing line there. And they have a little different personalities depending on where you're at. But next slide, please. So this is my office and what it looks like where I'm at. So this is, uh, uh, this is, it's a small enclosed bay. And at the moment, I don't remember what its name, if it's Eridura Bay, but uh, it's kind of a little bay and apparently it has some history in terms of that was a location for pirates years ago because it's a, it's oh, a small yeah. enclosure there and so the football team in Coquimbo is named after the pirates so that's <laughs> that's their, their team but uh, kind of by that uh, electric tower there down below there's a really nice marine lab there we've got uh, ocean water great facilities all kinds of neat stuff it's really good um, and so I'm Yes, I'm up above, and I'm, you're kind of looking down on that area. The campus is, is about 6,000 students, is what it is. So it's, uh, it's a nice size, but it's really the aquaculture hub for UCN, is what it is. So, Next slide, please. So that's UCN, or the Universidad Católica del Norte. But I'm also working with a group called CIAS, which is the Centro de Estudios Avanzados en Zonas Aridas. Now, Obviously, the ocean is not an arid zone, if you, you thought twice about that, because there's a lot of water there. But, uh, Siaza has three different uh, departments, and so there's the Grupo Geosciencias, the Grupo Biotech, and the Grupo Mar. And so I'm part of the Grupo Mar in Tejema, which is a Laboratorio de Physiologia y Genetica Marina. So we study how organisms work and use that to improve aquaculture, uh, etc. Um, again, I'm working with Katarina Brocourt, Claudio Alvarez, and the executive director of Siaza is Carl Carlos Alavaria. And so Carlos, uh, Katarina, and Claudio have been fabulous. Carlos obviously financing it through Siaza, and, uh, but uh, Dr. Brocourt, Dr. Alvarez are both have one foot in Siaza, one foot in, one foot in UCN as well. So they teach, but they also have their research presences through this government entity named Siasa. Next slide. Okay, so aquaculture in Chile. I'm coming from Mississippi, which is a very wet state, and we're probably number one in the U.S. for aquaculture production, at least for freshwater species. Uh, so I have to say to start off, eat more fish. So that's my first thing. If I say nothing else, 
support your, your aquaculture industry. Uh, it's, it can be expensive, yes, but it's, it's going to be healthy. Can I ask you a question about this? Okay. No questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I was expecting to find a lot of fish here mm -hmm. in general to eat. Yeah. You know. Now, I haven't been to the Mercado Central, which I understand is the big fish market, but in the supermarkets, I've been either. And they don't have a lot of fish. There's a very, very small, in fact, and it was only two fish. There's tilapia, and there was something else that I didn't recognize. There was no salmon. Interesting. And I, and I want, I, my kids like salmon. I thought, yeah, we're going to get tons of salmon. Yeah. So why is that? <laughs> go to the mercado. Yeah. Well, we've got to go to the mercado. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, but then you're buying it like directly from the vendors, or for the, yeah. you know, whoever's there. Yeah. But I was surprised at the supermarkets. Now, yeah. maybe Jumbo or something has it. Well, what supermarket did you go well, to? Well, neither. No, I went to the big leader. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, on Tovalaba. Mm -hmm. and, and I had to ask him, where's the fish? Do you guys sell fish? He's like, oh, yeah. And it was a very small nothing. And it was tilapia and one, one other one. Well, you went yeah. to the leader yeah. here. That's, but well, I'm sure fish we can discuss it. Well, we can discuss it. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm just curious. No, it it relates to the fish issue. It's a good, issue, it's a good I was, question. I was surprised because yeah. yeah. I thought that there would be, you know, all I can guess is, you know, our leader has a bigger selection. Jumbo yeah. has it much bigger. So but, maybe it's spicy. And then they have, you know, your local fish markets. Obviously, we're right on the coast. I found meat markets, yeah. but yeah. not fish markets. Yeah. On the coast, yeah. We, we have right. a, a variety right. of fish right. markets, sure. etc. Right. right. But, yes. Why your leader doesn't have it, I don't know. But no, you I was need wondering to about distribution. <laughs> I was wondering about the fish distribution. Though. Yeah. Yeah. And so, anyway. you know, in terms of marketing, I'm not sure. But... Uh, you'll be familiar with salmon from the U.S. It's common. You go into any grocery store and it's usually you can find product of Chile, right. Chilean salmon. Yeah. 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 So it's a big, <coughs> pardon me, export yeah, product. Coffee. You can't get good coffee. Uh, in terms of shellfish in um, Chile, uh, there's a number of different types of mariscos you can get. If you get scallops, those are almost exclusively aquaculture, uh, just due to limitations on natural overharvest, etc. There's also osteone, uh, a number of you know, clams, etc. Um, and where they are and where they aren't is a good question, but that's, I'm not a marketer in terms of the, the networks to get it there. What, uh, what does aquaculture mean exactly? It's an excellent question. Uh, <laughs> so aquaculture... It's not farming. It's not fish farming. It literally is fish farming, <laughs> or it's farming of aquatic organisms. So it's the culture of organisms in water, so aquaculture. So right, it's not growing water, but it's growing organisms in water. Uh, so it's agriculture is what it, what it comes down to. Uh, and so Chile has, I guess the best way to put it is all the eggs are in one basket for the most part, and that basket is salmon. And so it's a huge industry. Uh, it's government supported. There's partnerships with Norway, etc. Uh, but if the Chilean industry for salmon has a big problem in the basket, there's a big problem for the economy. And so as a result, uh, the government of Chile has realized that. And so they're looking at ways to diversify that. And so they've identified four species of fish to uh, invest in. And so this is through the Programa de Diversificación de la Aquacultura Chilena, or PEDASH. And uh, so these are the four fishes. The top one is the one I'll be studying. I'll talk more about that, but that's Cohinova. There's Corvina, and that's uh, the second one. And uh, there is uh, Congrio Colorado, or Genipterus chilensis, which is another one that's up and coming. Uh, and I think you might see it in the market in English as conger eel or something like that. I'm wondering what like this that. other fish okay. that I saw was. Huh. Uh, and then there's Seriola or Palometa, which is Seriola lalandi, which is actually related to tunas. Huh. And that's cultured in northern Chile as well. What so, about the sea bass? The Chile, isn't there like a danger in the Chilean sea bass? There's the Patagonian toothfish or the Chilean sea bass, and it's, it's uh, wild capture. So it, it's down south. Uh, but these four, importantly, are all native Chilean species. Mm -hmm. And so for the culture of these, aquaculture is always like any type of business or entity or agriculture. You know, they're trying to improve, etc. Uh, if you have a non-native species that escapes, there could be potential problems with that. And so obviously salmon 
is not native to Chile. Uh, it's grown here. It's from the north. Uh, and so wait, the Chilean salmon is the same species of salmon that's like Alaskan salmon? That's right. No, not or Alaskan. Pacific salmon. Atlantic salmon. Okay. Atlantic salmon is the it's the chicken of the sea in the northern area, so to speak. And yes, so tilapia, catfish would be your so chicken of the fresh water. So wait, is so, tilapia native to, to Chile? No, no. no. Oh, interesting. Probably the tilapia, tilapia you're getting here is imported from Southeast Asia. See, Philippines, like, I think it is. Oh, there. China, so the Philippines. People say, the people say so the tilapia that yeah. we bought in the leader is probably imported. Same, no, same from here. Same well, vendors so sell it to the U.S. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I wouldn't Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So this charismatic, beautiful fish. <laughs> this is known as the Kogi Nova. Spoken as only uh, specialist in aquaculture. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a, it's a beautiful look fish. Look at the eyes. Look how, look how it can see. Yes, it's a Cereolea violacea. And uh, fortunate for us, uh, so originally when I, I came here, I thought I might be working with Corvina. But uh, Corvina, it turns out, just due to the timing of things, um, it wasn't available. But thankfully, Kohinoba is available. And Kohinoba is also a very promising species. Uh, it's native to northern Chile. It's a food fish. If you go into Coquimbo markets, you will find uh, Kohinoba. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really neat fish. Uh, and thankfully, the culture processes have already been under study. So, we're really at the point, and I say we, speaking for myself as a Chilean, but we're ready to, to move these fish from sort of the culture process into partnering with uh, private industry. So they're looking at that right now. And that's kind of one of the neat things about aquaculture in Chile is the university system, the government partners with private industry here. And so there's a lot of subsidized aquaculture to help get the product started because there's a lot of scientific know-how in terms of how do you grow a new species, sort of how do you make a chicken better, so to speak. Oh, you, know, you can't just go out and make a chicken better. It takes a lot of research. So this is like in giant tanks? Like, where are you We're, we're getting stuff? to that. We're getting to that. So, <laughs> next slide. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so, one of the challenges is, is that when you raise a species, uh, oftentimes that you're changing the environment that's natural to them, to some extent, because you're, you're trying to grow them economically, etc. And so you're looking at species that are well adapted to a natural environment that you're changing to culture, so that, that uh, culture well, so to speak. Uh, and there's some challenges. So typically, if you look at the top picture, you have what's called brood stock. This is, you know, sort of mom and pop of the fish. You spawn those, you hatch them out, and usually they're in very high densities in tanks. Economically, this is important. And uh, uh, also, one of the problems, and then you move them to, uh, say, let's say on the coast, uh, a farmer that would have a net pen. So this would be your private industry. Uh, the challenge is, is that the water quality is dependent on the area. Now, Chile has fantastic water quality in most of the areas around. And part of it is you get these upwelling currents, just like off the coast of California, back in the States, very high productivity, et cetera. So, but one of the challenges of that as well is that when that water upwells, it's coming from deep ocean environments, loaded with nutrients, low in oxygen often. And so you can get these low oxygen or hypoxia zones for periods of the year, typically during the upwelling of November to March, you may see some episodic hypoxia. Now, if you're a fish and you're not in a net pen, well, you could move around a little bit depending on the conditions. But if you're in a net pen, you're a fixed location. This is important to a, a, a fish farmer because they need to have their location, they need to go feed the fish, it's logistics. But if the ocean changes while the fish are in there, uh, you can have die-offs in there, and this is obviously not good if you're the farmer, you've invested in this, etc. So there have been some challenges with this. So it's very important to know well, what are the limits of each species, how do they handle hypoxia, or whatever challenges they are, immune, etc. Um, so it can occur in dense aggregations. In the U.S., actually, from Mississippi, 
it occurs from agricultural fertilizer. So we put all this fertilizer on the farmland, washes in the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River takes the U most of the U.S. water down to the Gulf of Mexico, and we have what's called the dead zone. So you have this huge hypoxic zone from all these fertilizers, huge plankton boom and die off, and then you have very low uh, oxygen water. So this is something well known in, in Mississippi and that region. Uh, so it can be caused by people, it can be caused by natural processes as well. Okay, bottom line for aquaculture, you're growing an animal, just like a terrestrial agriculture, and anything that, that limits the growth rates or affects survival is problematic. So, next slide. Okay, so these are our experiments. Uh, while I'm here, I'll, I'll be doing research and teaching, and so this is the research component. We'll be looking at the performance capacity. So basically, how does the fish function as, uh, almost think of it as a machine. So what's the machine need to work properly, and how does it work optimally? And so that's really the goal of aquaculture, is to make the conditions right for that machine. Or in some situations, uh, in some places, you change how the machine works with uh, genetic engineering, et cetera. Uh, but that's not the case here, so just to make that clear. So this is natural fish, etc. Uh, we're going to look at the physiological responses to hypoxia, or low oxygen, from the whole animal to the organ level down to the molecular level as well. So what are the different things turning on and off that relate to tolerance to hypoxia, or low oxygen? Uh, and then as well, it takes energy uh, to live. It takes energy to grow. Oxygen is very important for that. And so if you have less oxygen, you have less ATP generation. And so as a result, uh, you have less energy to go around. So what one of the common things is, is organisms won't eat as much if oxygen goes down because they can't process the food, etc. And they need the oxygen just to survive. Same type of a thing if you have, uh, let's say, you're at a high density here. You're on the metro. And uh, if there's one other person down the metro a long ways, they're coughing, they've got a cold, no problem. But if we're all in a tight density and somebody's coughing, there's more chance that somebody's going to catch that cough from somebody else. Same thing with fish or other organisms in agriculture. So, uh, and whenever you, uh, an animal gets sick, it's also going to take energy to fight off that immune response. If they have less uh, energy to, to start with, they're going to be more susceptible. Just like if you guys have been stressed, you put your students through final exams, they're up all night, they're going to get sick more easily. These types of things. So, next slide. Okay, so some of the experiments we'll be starting off with, uh, we're actually doing this now because I've been here about a month and uh, just getting things going. Exercise physiology, so how do Kohinova work? How do they function? Uh, tolerance to short-term hypoxia, so similarly to just knowing what are the limits of this species in terms of what can they handle. And then look at, okay, so we know that they can handle a short-term hypoxia level, whatever that is. What if we get sort of a recurrent hypoxia, which may be more natural. You know, you've got a couple days where you've got hypoxia, it goes away, it comes back. Are the fish able to mobilize or adapt to the situation over time? So looking at that. Uh, and then in the end, trying to look at what are these uh, molecular mechanisms and uh, that relate to enzyme changes to the whole organism, why do they do better than other organisms, etc.? And how do different uh, species change? And looking at appetite control, so obviously if they're not eating, they're not growing, and the farmer is not making money, which is always the bottom line because it's a business. Uh, and then immunology, so knowing that the farmer has all their fish in a certain area, they're obviously going to be concerned about immune effects, immune challenge, uh, and obviously investors and the farmers are going to be concerned about that as well. Next slide. All right, so this is just one example of a physiological type test, and because I think most folks uh, probably haven't seen fish going, you can press the little button and, and watch a fish swim. <laughs> so this is basically a fish treadmill here, and so you can see there's a little propeller there, and uh, we've got, that's our little Kobe Nova. It's a beautiful fish. So uh, it's in there. And uh, so it's working out. It's on the treadmill for the day right here. For the day? And 
we can do different things. You can see this is the this is the photogenic version over here. Basically, this is the Kohinoba where it'd be kind of somewhat covered up, let some light in, but so there's not other external stressors of yours truly looking in at it and having it go. What what's that up there? I have a predator response to that. So. But we can do different things. We've got uh, a fiber optic oxygen probe that measures it, so it measures every second. And uh, we can then look at different levels of exercise. We can then look at, uh, in terms of subject the fish to short-term hypoxia, how do they then respond? Is there a metabolic scope? Are they built to escape or, or function, reduce? We can give them an immune challenge and then say, how does that affect their ability in terms of survival, exercise function, et cetera. So this is just one of the tests. And we can look at, take blood samples, tissue samples, look at all the changes that are occurring. So uh, UCN and Siaza has some excellent facilities and people to collaborate with. And uh, I have just fallen into great place here. So I am uh, feeling very fortunate. Next slide. OK teaching component and so equally as important as the research is teaching and I'll be teaching in the PhD program in aquaculture here so this is kind of a really neat program it's a in the US I don't know how this would be pulled off because there's three universities that work together and so in the US that's just a great thing but it doesn't happen very often but here there's one aquaculture PhD program in southern Chile there's one in northern Chile and so I'm in the one in northern Chile and it is a cooperative program between three universities, University of Chile, uh, UCN, and you can see the Universidad Católica del Valparaiso. The neat thing if you're a PhD student is you do a rotation. You go from one university to the next to the next. So you get to see all the different professors and you take classes at each location. And then in the end, they choose in terms of where they're going to do their PhD study. And uh, they've already had the contacts there. So it's, it's a really neat program. We could learn some things from Chile in the States, I think. But, uh, and I'm going to be teaching, uh, co-teaching a class with uh, Claudio and Katarina on aquaculture, physiology of fish, and uh, stress responses of aquatic organisms. So it's actually Physiologia del Estrés in Organismos Aquacolis. So, it's, I'd take the class if I had the opportunity, so it should be, it should be great. Next slide. All right, and I know my time is coming to a, a conclusion. I can be very long-winded, so it, it's, uh, I'll try and end it quickly here, but I just want to thank Mason and Sylvia and all the people who have done amazing things, and especially uh, Katarina Brocourt and Claudio Alvarez, who have been phenomenal to work with taking care of all the things that somebody who does is not fluent in Spanish yet and helping my family to get through just different cultural changes and so they've been fabulous. This is my family here, that's my lovely wife Tammy and those are our two girls Amanda and Cassie and they may be watching right now so I know they're going to watch that live feed. So. And uh, Katarina and Claudia if you're out there as well, uh, great to see you as well and uh, so they are in uh, La Serena, Coquimbo, and uh, actually one other group besides uh, Siasa and Carlos that has uh, helped sponsor this as well is my own department, obviously giving me the opportunity to come here from Mississippi State, and that's uh, thanks to those folks as well. So thank you guys for this opportunity. It's, it's amazing. Do fish sleep? The fish sleep, well, they reduce energy expenditure. They go into, and it depends on the fish. Some fish are constantly swimming. Uh, so it's, there are over 25,000 species of fish. From the fish person side, you know, I like to say that in some ways we're all fish. We've sort of just come from fish. And so there's more fish than any other organism in terms of you combine the mammals, the reptiles, Birds, there's still more fish than all those other groups. Not insects, right? No, insects, we we'll have vertebrates here, so, <laughs> yeah. But yes, fish can have basically a low energy state for a period of time where they are not very responsive to external stimuli. 
Is that they sleep? Just float or they go yeah, is that sleep? Depends on the species. You know, a lot of fish in uh, ocean environments, like around reefs, can basically kind of remain quiescent for a period of time. And uh, so it's a low, uh, a protracted, low energy state. 